six week old baby yeah uh, uh, which was pretty mad the timing of that coinciding with the timing of opening like a new online film uh, experience uh, which we've never done before so there's a lot of like new 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 elements to my life right now yeah um, so yeah it's been pretty nuts i'm not gonna lie <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i've uh, i've been through the uh i mean i'm still sort of going through it but i've got two two young kids myself and i remember that first period is um yeah, I mean, there's new challenges every five seconds, but yeah, that's <laughs> it's, it's a difficult one, particularly when yeah, you've got this. I think, you know, and you think because everyone's done it, right? You know, like your parents, you know, you know, my, my, you know, my dad, you know, and somebody who I wouldn't say is the most skilled craftsman in the world, uh, the most <laughs> able person, perhaps. I'm like, well, if he can do it, you know, and that's got a huge newfound respect for anyone who's done it you know like I walk down the street and I see a mum with two kids I'm like give that woman a medal because yeah. it's um nothing can prepare you for it um and um but you know it's it, it's, it's an amazing thing um and it's nothing can prepare you for how amazing it is and how ridiculous it is as well yeah, yeah. it just changes changes everything overnight really you know it does. It does. It does. Uh, yeah. No, I've got uh, I've got one kid that's uh, approaching four. It's his fourth birthday very soon, and I was out trying to uh, to find him something half decent for his birthday. So, uh, and then my other one is turning two in May, um, but thankfully they're both in school at the moment, so it gives me a chance to uh, <laughs> to get some work done. And uh, nice. yeah, 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 yeah. So you're in you're in Spain, right? Yeah, yeah. We 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 moved to i had a show running in london about a year ago um when everything got kind of cancelled obviously um and we were already planning on moving to spain um to san sebastian i'd lived in london i've lived in cities my whole life um and we kind of thought we wanted to change a pace and i travel so much with the shows that rather than and my shows will always be in, in large cities so we thought it'd be nicer to be able to come back to somewhere with a completely different, you know, it's not about the hustle here. It's not about the career here. It's about enjoying life. It's about long lunches. It's about, it's it's all about, um, you know, kind of, you know, having a more kind of enjoyable life. You know, that's the Southern, the Italian, French and, uh, and, and kind of Spanish way, which is, which is quite appealing as you get a little bit older when, you know, the grind of London or the hustle of New York just doesn't, isn't that appealing anymore you know yeah 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 no I, I totally feel that I went to uh, I'm, I'm now in Sweden myself and uh, after living in Hong Kong for five years coming here it's just a completely different uh pace and you know there's far how less come you're in Sweden? how come my wife is uh my wife is Swedish uh and she's from from Gothenburg so I, I've been here quite a few times over the years uh but um we lived in London for a very long time before moving to Hong Kong so Similarly, we, we had the, the, the hustle and bustle and we lived in these, these huge cities. And then um, when the kids came, we were sort of like, we were living out in Discovery Bay. I mean, you, you, may, have, you may be familiar with it. Um, Disco Bay, yeah. Disco <laughs> Bay, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, that was, um, that was, it was, it was nice. I really enjoyed it out there and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but when, uh, as the kids were starting to get older, we were like, uh, maybe, maybe we can try something a little different for a while. And uh, and see how that goes. Um, so yeah, so now we're in Gothenburg. We've got a little uh, Stuga, uh, which is a sort of Swedish for summer house, like a mini mini cabin in the forest, which is super remote. So we're we're not there all the time, but it's nice to get out there and uh, and you know enjoy the enjoy the wildlife and you know the forests and that. But uh, so Sebastian, San Sebastian, my um, my wife actually was there for quite a while. She was doing a um, a dance project there many years ago she's she's not dancing now but she was a, a professional dancer for a while and um so I went out to see her quite on a few occasions and I absolutely love it there it's such a nice uh, beautiful place super chill yeah. as you said and uh it, it rained quite a lot when I was there is it is it, it does it rain a lot generally or is it uh, or would you get a fair well, bit of sunshine as well I'm Scottish so for me <laughs> it's tropical mate it's not I, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now you can see the rain and I'm wearing a t-shirt so for mm. me it's all right mm. here is like it can rain a little bit but you know the summers are hot and um 
you know, it's uh, it, it, it does rain. That is a kind of frustrating thing about it. I was a bit like, why did we move here? But, you know, like you, my wife is Spanish. She's from the Basque country. So it made sense if you want to have a kid rather than trying to go alone in one of these big cities, you know. So yeah, yeah. it makes sense for a lot of other reasons. But, yeah, it does. It can rain. It can rain. But you get like... <laughs> You get like the proper four seasons in, in one day and then it's you know and then it's then it's beautiful and and it's kind of run by kids and the older people like you got yeah. you see guys like 60 years old tearing into the sea you know which is quite oh, nice. inspiring you know and young kids surfing and skateboarding and, and doing all that kind of stuff so it's it's an interesting place and it's got like a big film festival it has a kind of um yeah, which is similar to Cannes, I guess. So it has a, has a, it has just enough to keep it keep it like you know interesting. Um, and and yeah, the food's amazing. So yeah, it's great. Nice, nice, nice. I um I'm really happy to have uh, Richard on for 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 those that aren't familiar with your work. I'm sure there aren't there aren't many people out there that are not familiar with your work. But Richard is uh, the artistic director of Secret Theatre. Uh, which is a phenomenal immersive theatre company. Uh, they've travelled all around the world doing these shows, um, and they are they are they are brilliant. Um, I, I was very close to to being in one of your shows, which I which I was super gutted I couldn't do in the end. Um, but I had a lot of friends right. that were that were involved. I had Candice, who has actually been on the podcast as well, um, who was who was directing and and acting in it, and. Uh, Hamish Campbell, who, who, who came on board and uh, Barry, I've worked a lot of familiar names and faces for me. And, uh, um, but, but your work is, is, is phenomenal. And you've got a brand new show coming out, which as you said at the beginning is online. Um, and is it, what, were, were there any, uh, did you face, what sort of challenges did you face when you were creating this huge online Where, where do I begin? Yeah, where do I begin? <laughs> exactly. Um, and the challenges that I'm facing on a daily basis, every show, every show, show has its problems and every show is almost a miracle to pull off, including the one that I did in Hong Kong that, um, you know, we talked to you about being a part of at Tycoon, you know, um, but the online thing is, is pretty crazy because what we wanted to do was, you know, we've done shows in different cities in the world. So we thought we'd have sort of characters from each city in the world and do it live from different time zones. So it's it's kind of an it's kind of a nightmare to program from that perspective, yeah. um, because you've got to put it on at different times. Um, also, um, people from my company, you know, it's about live performance, right? So, um, and this is a new online thing, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what exactly it is and what exactly I'm gonna gonna do in this thing. Because how do you make you know my currency is immersive? You know, that's what I've I wanted. You know. All those years ago when I was studying theatre as an actor and stuff and you know I wanted to kind of cross that line to make it more interesting and see if you, you could make theatre progressive uh, which of course it has now I think immersive everyone's aware of what that is there's loads of different versions of it um, so making it live has been difficult programming has been difficult and making it an experience where when you watch it you can get involved is tricky um, and yeah, so and, and also the, the nature of the world just now um, with obtaining props and costumes and, and having to direct something with COVID regulations and having to be really aware of that is, is, is a real challenge. Um, and, you know, but we, we just felt we don't know when we're going to be able to open the doors again for live, live theatre. Um, I mean, London is still, if you're looking at Broadway or the West End is kind of a, a sign of, of when things are going to happen. Well, then they're not talking, they're talking about the summer, maybe. Okay. So it's a long time for us not to be in operation. So we felt it was a good time to create something. And also people can watch it at home, which is pretty cool. Amazing. That is amazing. Um, and uh, so can, can you uh, explain to our listeners very briefly, like how, uh, the, you know, how, it, how, it, how it's going to work? Like how do they actually enjoy this immersive experience through I, I presume it's run uh, through zoom or, or, or a similar platform to that so it's redemption room um i we wanted to do a play on something that we could all attach ourselves to now like celebrity culture um mm. so we have these um six characters who are kind of disgraced that we're going to put through their paces on a kind of dark version a black mirror version of the hunger games if you like 
Nice. So we've got a politician in London, um, a disgraced athlete in, in New York, a disgraced comedian in Sydney, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a DJ in Mumbai. And these guys are going to all come into the studio. So when you, if you bought your ticket today, you can actually go into the website and start messaging these people straight away. So you can message Addison in New York and ask her why she's going on the program, why she, why she took steroids at the Olympics, because they've all got a little bit of a backstory. Um, you know, why why the DJ, why the 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 um, the comedian told that racist joke that got him cancelled. So straight away they can kind of build a relationship and a rapport with these guys. Um, and then um, when the show begins, you can, there's a chat box and there's, you can, you vote live on what you want these characters to do. And then we, we've got a bit of a twist on it where it kind of, it turns into a bit of a kind of horror thriller experience where you see kind of um, a kind of uh, a, a horror thriller experience unfold live um, for these guys on this kind of um, platform. So it's like the tone and mood of it would be like a kind of episode of Black Mirror, um, but live. Um, and um, yeah, it's, 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 it's something that it should be a lot of fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. If you, if you like horror films, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, I, I mean, a lot of your shows are, uh, from what I've seen, are quite, um, they're intense, they're spooky, they keep you on the edge of your seat, they keep you thinking, but also that the audience have such a massive part to play in the production and I think that's such a such an, an awesome aspect to it that they they're not just coming to sit down and 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 take a look at a bit of theater and and you know uh, have a bit of food and and you know whatever it, it's it's sort of like an all-round you could well you can come in you can have a little bite to eat beforehand but then they are thrown into this world and then you know they have such power over the final conclusion and how it all sort of how it all sort of works itself out and it's just um it's super exciting. I can't wait uh, to, I, I definitely want to jump in to one of these rooms and, and take a look myself. Um, but how, let's jump back a little bit. How did, uh, how did it all come about in the first place for you? This, this concept of, uh, you know, the secret theater, the immersive theater, is that something you've always wanted to do? What was the, the initial journey for, the, for those that, you know, might be interested in doing something similar themselves? Well, I was an actor and I was in London and I was, I was, I would say a struggling actor, but a lot, an actor's life really is a struggle. Um, as you know, it's a hustle. Um, and um, I found it difficult and expensive to kind of um, keep doing uh, acting classes. Uh, so I started doing stand up comedy, not because I thought I was particularly funny or I had good material, but I could create these characters and it meant that I could write, I could direct and I could practice acting, which in um, comedians, you know, fall into two categories, really realism or they create a character of themselves. So one of the things I loved doing when I did that was the interacting with the audience. So I thought that was really interesting and really fun and something that they really enjoyed doing rather than just seeing a guy stand up there cracking jokes was actually bring them into it. And I loved that part of stand up comedy. Um, I got in a show in uh, a play in New York. So then I was in New York and then I started, attended the Lee Strasberg Institute acting studio while I was there. And I was looking at method acting whilst doing a bit of stand up comedy. And I was like, you know, met some really interesting people there. Um, we ended up moving into a big 20,000 square foot warehouse where like kind of photo shoots and movies were being filmed. And me and a couple of my friends were like, we should totally do, you know, a live, live theater here. So we started doing live shows um, and we started progressing them. And, and then they became a little bit immersive um, because we just wanted to, to be progressive, move away from Broadway. You know, when I was living in New York, no one could afford, no one went to see new plays on Broadway. It wasn't something that um, young actors or artists were doing because they couldn't afford it. And I think a lot of the shows weren't that maybe appealing anyway. So we were like, can we do something that appeals to people that make up the fabric of the city rather than tourists? People who wouldn't normally go to see plays and get them involved so they can talk to the characters and the actors. Um, and we just kept pushing it and pushing it. And then, um, you know, we ended up doing really cool shows there. We did a Edward Scissorhands production in line with when Tim Burton had a show on at the MoMA where you kind of, you know, it was in a secret location and Edward was there walking around and um, people were kind of loving it. So I just felt like it was something we could just kind of keep pushing. And then, yeah, and then moved back to London um, and 
kept it going, kept it going, and and then you know it moved just just moved on from there. So it's kind of like the sort of natural progression from seeing audiences wanting people want watching stuff wanting to interact now wanting to get more involved bringing it into theater and then really just just pushing it and it is sometimes it is a real challenge to create something um that works because it needs to work you know and sometimes in the early days it didn't um and then you know the last few years we've had success because we've through trial and error we kind of know what we're doing now how did you overcome any uh, any challenges that you faced in those early days you mentioned that you know, sometimes it didn't quite work out for, for other people out there that might be at the beginning of their, their journey, as, as you will, in terms of creating theatre for, for themselves and others. How did you get around that? How did you get around those particular challenges that you faced? Um, well, I mean, if like early shows. So I did an immersive. Uh, we did an immersive Reservoir Dogs in London. Um, uh, and I love Reservoir Dogs and, and, I, and I, I wanted to change it up. I didn't want it to be a bunch of white guys. So like, you know, when I was looking at, because when I change these adaptations, I always set them there in the town they're in. Mm -hmm. So for example, in, in London, you know, like Mr. White was black and Mr. Pink was a girl. And the, so the gang had a really different feel to it. And I really loved the show, but making that immersive was almost like Mission Impossible. So you, and, and some of the actors didn't get on and there was a lot of tension around that. So when you're running it or creating it like me, you, you need to roll, it, it's, it's really tough, but you, you have to roll the punches and you have to get through it. You have to get through um, bad reviews. You have to get, get through um, it, it being a new concept. So actors not really getting it. Like, oh, wait a minute, you want me to start talking to the audience now? Um, <laughs> So that side of it was really difficult with Reservoir Dogs. And it felt like, you know, when you, when actors were falling out and the reviews weren't great, there was like this, this problem. But then the other side of it was, it was selling out and people were, audiences were really enjoying it. And um, we extended the run. So I could see that there was a taste for it, um, but I needed to take a, a big break after that and take a big deep breath and go, okay, like how do I make it so that it's an enjoyable experience for everyone and that it is, it's, it's effective so that um, it, it will get, you know, recognized so that the actors can enjoy those shows as well. And you have to, in London, you have to get through a lot of problems. A lot of traditional theater critics still to this day will come and savage my shows because they don't like the idea of immersive theater. They don't like that. It's, they think it's a bit of a gimmick. They think it's kind of, ruining you know taking away the you know the traditional four walls of of theater which i love but it's just it's just uh, it's just another concept and it's something that's progressive but when you do something progressive and new you're always going to face a bit of criticism but if people come then it kind of spurns you on just just to keep going and you know by the end of it you know the cast are all getting on the cast are all seeing it and i'm like biting my lips i felt i didn't push it kind of far enough but now I could and, and I didn't know all the answers then now I can sit in a room with like the guys in Hong Kong in Tycoon and they go wait a minute at this point 150 people get up and try and dismantle a bomb how the hell is that going to work and I can say this is how it's going to work because I've got the experience but in the early days you had to kind of go ah uh, trust me and I was like you know I was young you know I was directing some of these shows 28 29 years old, you know, some shows directing older guys who've been there and done it in London um, and having to have a kind of thick skin, which was difficult. So you got to roll with criticism, you got to roll punches, you got to believe in what you're doing and um, and persevere and then believe in the believe in the projects. And then, you know, now it's just been, you know, the last few years have been really, really kind of um, successful for us until yeah. COVID. That's so cool. So, um, well, there we go, guys. So, it, you know, there's there's going to be challenges, uh, at, you know, creating and making new theatre, particularly if it's moving away from, you know, uh, conventional theatre quotation marks. Um, but to be strong, to be to be to believe in what you're doing, uh, and to sort of you know push push through those initial challenges and barriers, and then on the on the end of that, on the other side of that, you know, it, it, once you have the experience and then and the know how, it, it all sort of starts to fall into place. Um, but persistence and, and tenacity seem to be uh, pretty key in the early days for, for Richard. Um, can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about your experience 
uh, in New York and at, at the, the Lee Strasberg Theatre School, because I myself personally have always had this sort of admiration for that school for, for, for many reasons, but, but largely my two of my favourite actors back in the day, Pacino and De Niro, obviously trained there and Meryl Streep and there's just so many huge names coming out of that school. Um, so I've always had this admiration for, for the school and it's a place that I would have loved to have gone to. I mean, I could still potentially go one day, who knows, but um, what was the experience like? How, what were the teachers like? You know, I mean, was it an enjoyable experience or, 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 or not so yeah, much? It was, it was, it was, it was, the, you know, I come from a small town in Scotland. So for me, I've always been like, if I am like, when I first moved to London and I was just trying to be an actor, that was like enough. Mm. And when I was in like going to an audition, not getting the part, when I was going to an audition in Times Square, I was just like, wow. So that kind of, that kind of helped me. And then when I when I went to Lee Strasberg and started taking classes, it was it was amazing. I mean, you've got the Marilyn Monroe Theater, you've got the pictures on all the walls of all these, you know, Marilyn Monroe, De Niro, Pacino, whoever, all these guys who who went there. You've got teachers who talk about you know stories about you know their acting partner was Gene Hackman and mm. and how um, and how Lee Strasberg developed his um, his his warm up techniques and how he developed all his um, all his approaches to acting. The huge misconception with method acting now is people go you know you'll they'll take someone like a Shia LaBeouf and they'll go he's a method actor because he plays, he's playing an, an alcoholic guy who is a killer. So he goes out at night and he gets drunk in his car and kills, you know, rodents or whatever he got found out for doing recently, which is just like the opposite of what it is. You know, it's taking, um, like it's taking um, your self-life experiences and putting it into, into like real life kind of drama. So it was really interesting seeing some of the uh, teachers, um, pull that out of um, an actor and an act or an actress and see them put that into a scene. You know, this whole like notion of it, oh, I'm, I'm playing like a guy who's insomniac, so I don't sleep. It's just really kind of, that's kind of the, the, the badge it's got now, but none of those guys <laughs> do that. Because as you know, if you're, if you're, you know, Lee Strasberg designed things for theater. So in theater, if you're doing eight shows a week and you want to hit, if you're, Marlon Brando and you're in Streetcar Named Desire, you want to hit those notes every night. That's technique. You know, it's not a movie where you get loads of takes. It's, it's so there's so the technique is really interesting and it gives you quite a lot of tools um, which um, can work for can work for you, but they might not. A lot of actors who are very impulsive struggle with it. Um, but it was, you know, mind-blowingly interesting and you know, a really um, you know, one of my acting teachers, she just passed away. So if you if you went there in the next few years, you'd still catch um, teachers and directors who sat in rooms and, you know, taught Pacino or taught, you know, these guys. And they have all these like insane stories that, that are kind of like, you know, uh, just so interesting. Like, oh, I remember, you know, Scarlett Johansson, she couldn't get to the scene, you know, she was trying to trying too hard. So <laughs> I just went back to a moment in her life where she was really unhappy. And, and, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's that, that side of it is really cool. Um, so yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience and it inspired me to, to really do my own thing. And a lot of um, teachers come, a lot of actors who to come to the school and, and talk to you, right? Which is really cool because they're like, really famous people, James Gandolfini, you know, Tony Soprano and Michael Im Imperoliano, who, who played Tony Soprano's nephew, Chris. Okay. Um, and he was like, you, you know, the advice he gave to everyone was start your own thing, yeah. start your own thing, because you're never going to consistently work. And the, the horrible thing about being an actor is we're not painters, we're not musicians, we need to be around people to act, to, to train. You know, we need to be around, you know, you need a script, you need a director, you need, you can't just do it by yourself, you know. So he, him and Pacino, you know, all these guys, Kevin Spacey, they all have small, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, they all have small theatre companies in New York. That's what's so interesting about New York, as opposed to any other city, including London, that I've seen. It has this huge world of small, independent theatre, mm -hmm. and a lot of these big guys do it. 
and it's because you know they get to play you know they get to play the roles you know Shylock you know Pacino wanted to play Shylock I'll just do it in my own company the guy from The Sopranos he was constantly getting cast as like the Italian mafia guy well I could do more than that so I'm going to start my own company and 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 show that and people went because it was him but they saw him doing different things and that was that kind of inspired me as well to go right okay you know I was getting a little bit of work here and there in in New York but I was like I'm going to start my own thing so that if I'm ever not working, I, I open my own show. So I'm surrounded by actors. So I'm meeting costume designers all the time. I'm in New York. I'm meeting. Um, that was my, my whole network. Um, so that, that is always the advice I would give people is it's quite difficult to, it sounded pretentious of me in London because I was doing so many different things. I was doing comedy. I was working at a nightclub. I was doing all these different things. I didn't define myself as an actor. But when I went to New York, I could really do that. I woke up every morning, I was like, I'm an actor. And when I wasn't working, even if I was walking dogs or serving drinks, whatever I was doing, I always had something up my sleeve. I've got this show coming out. I'm working on the script of my, my company. And then I would do my shows. And then my shows took over my, my, my other my professional side of my agent. So I ended up just doing, just doing my shows. So it's, it's quite a kind of hard thing to do, but I think that's not something that they drill into actors uh, acting schools and um yeah. you know they, they, they you just kind of fly out of these schools and you don't know the business of acting and you don't know how important it is to that skill of just with three or four of your friends to just start something new you can amazing plays of only four people in them and you can go to edinburgh festival you can go to festivals all over the world that do shows cheap and just keep that kind of that kind of um maintenance of being an actor and that can lead you into writing can lead you into directing and all that kind of stuff and they don't quite teach you to do that i think no no uh, wow um do you miss it do you miss being in 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 that world in in new york with all that going on around you or do you get to go back at, at all well, obviously outside of covid but um... yeah i mean i was there you know i was there four or five years you know i was in london on and off for eight and i i miss i miss the people of course and i miss those um i, I do miss i miss i miss that city for sure you know and i you know this but you know there's all these other cities you know i've lived i've done what, four or five shows in hong kong you know like i've lived in four or five different parts of hong kong i've got friends there now um i you miss some days you have a show, I, show in, Sing, uh, in singapore as well right yeah, we've done Singapore, you know, I've done Los Angeles and there's, and you know, I always make friends in these cities. And that's one of the cool things about today's world is that, you know, you have all these friends all over the world that you can connect to on social media. But then you always kind of envy, I always envy sort of people that, you know, stayed in this small town because they've got like this nucleus of like six real friends that are just always there. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. Some days I miss... Some days I miss it, but it was a hustle. I mean, it was it, it was a lot. Those early years were a lot of hard work. You know, I mean, great. I was I was able to feel lucky and really enjoy them in the moment. But that 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 road to like becoming, you know, an artist is 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 pretty rocky in the early years, um, and um, it took it took quite a lot out of me. Um, so I'd love to go back now as a tourist um, and kind of enjoy a, a nice holiday there. I was actually planning on doing it. What, and one of the characters in Redemption Room is from New York, Addison Black. So, yeah, I'd love to go back. Yeah, yeah. I had a similar feeling with London. I still do have a similar feeling with London. It was a hustle for me, um, but I also really enjoy uh, enjoyed the city. And I went back, a friend of mine was got married about two years ago, and I went back to, to obviously for the wedding and then... I was just there as a tourist. I had a week and I just wandered around and saw all the nice, you know, nice coffee shops, went to the theater, um, went to the parks. And it was just, a, it was a completely different feeling for me uh, compared to what I had remembered about London, which was, you know, being on the underground, dealing with all the people and the pollution and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, that week just going back and having nothing really to do apart from obviously attend the wedding. I, uh, um, I, I, I had a really lovely uh, experience and uh, very fond memories now of, of London as a result of that. But um, cool. All right. So um, when when is your new show, uh, The Redemption Room? When does it uh, open up? It's to, towards the end of February, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's like in three weeks, which is pretty scary. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, 
I mean, it's all, I'm flying to London on, or filming parts of it out of London. I have a studio in London. So I'm flying to London on Saturday. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy thing to come together. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's one, one of the interesting things is that for the first time in over a decade, I'm not, there's no audience there. So the audience can, you know, that's, it's my currency, it's what I do, but it can be problematic, right? You've got hundreds of drunk people like, <laughs> hey, attending your shows. I mean, I've had some like crazy experiences, like for example, in Hong Kong, we had a show and the first part of it started on a boat. So people went, got, went to a pier and then we put them on a boat and there was a bar on the boat. So everyone got really drunk. And then there was a bomb on the boat and then these speed <laughs> boats came and I had to take them off. Oh, but I just didn't think, I just didn't think it would be that drunk. And people were like jumping off the, the this this boat onto a speed boat and like tearing to this like, um, this this haunted house in, in Lama Island in Hong Kong. And every, every night I was like, they were like, oh, this is so cool. This feels so dangerous. And I was like, <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah, don't worry, we've got Marines swimming around. You guys can totally do yeah. this. So, um, you know, and uh, they, they loved it, of course. Um, but so this is the first time I don't have the audience there in a long time. Wow. So it's going to feel kind of, it's more like directing a movie, you know, um, my relationship with the actors. And I've got to wear a mask and I'm going to be directing a lot of people from in different rooms, you know. So it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be totally unique. And I think there's obviously a sadness there about that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, but it's how everyone is suffering. Everyone, I mean, as we know, films and TV and everything's still being made. It's just under kind of extreme kind of circumstances. And um, it's quite tough for me because I, I do love that aspect of it. Like, you know, normally we have the read through and a nice venue and we go for drinks or whatever. Whereas this one, you know, everything's on Zoom and, um, you know, I might not even, I mean, I probably will, but I might not meet some of the actors, which is crazy, if you think of it. That um, is bizarre, yeah. So bizarre. So I'm, it, I'm interested to see how it goes. Is it an experience, uh, providing it all goes well, which I'm sure it will do, is it, it, would you consider running another production in this fashion in the future through the online medium? Or would, are you desperate to get an audience back in again as soon as humanly possible or virus possible? I, I mean... To be honest, I'm, I, I think we saw, we've always got to take each day as it comes. Like, I don't, I mean, we've got, I've got a call on Thursday about sh a, a new show in Hong Kong, because in Hong Kong, we, you know, we, we're doing really well. We had a waiting list for the last show. We, you know, it was probably our most successful numbers. Um, but we're just, this, this just now keeps us in the game. And one of the, one of the amazing things about this is because it's online, it's a lot cheaper. Mm. So for example, if you're a student in Hong Kong, you know, you might not be able to go to Tycoon because it wasn't at the cheapest ticket. Um, whereas, and a lot of young people, you know, they don't want to, I don't know, get dressed up and do the immersive stuff. So this opens us up to a new audience who don't necessarily like live immersive shows. Not everyone loves it, you know. Um, and it also means that, that it's nuts that on, you know, the opening night we sold tickets in Sydney and Mumbai and Delhi and, and um, you know, Bali in, in in Singapore and San Diego, Chicago, mm -hmm. Glasgow, you know, in Scotland. So it's like it's an insane, insane in, in a really cool way that you're 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 able to show people kind of what you're doing in all these different cities that you would never get the chance to normally go to. So I'm seeing the value in that. Um, and um, I think it's something, you know, this is an experience, it's experimental. It's immersive. It's live. It's a uh, really, it's a really cool concept. They've got some really interesting guys working on it. Got one of the stunt guys uh, from Vikings, the TV show Vikings. So I'm gonna give too much away, but I think we're gonna set someone on fire. Um, you know, we've got magician doing some work on it. I've got, um, you know, a, a sort of a woman from a horror movie that I really like for one little bit. So it's 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 a really cool, fun experience for me. So I'm gonna try and just really, really enjoy it. And I think that's as, as challenging as it is you know whatever whatever happens with this because i need to you know i need to go back to the early days because this might you know might people might not enjoy this it could might not be a commercial critical success um but just for us to give people the opportunity to do something because like london is on total lockdown right mm -hmm. they can't there's cinemas everything's closed you know so this is something that everyone in in the in the united kingdom um 
can can check out you know in in europe as well it's not exactly fun and games anywhere in the world right now um so we're we're putting something out there that i don't know about you but you know my wife and i were was kind of so bored of um netflix and amazon <laughs> you know, like, what we're going to watch now is like it's a scary. real str- it's a struggle to find anything on netflix for me at the moment um, yeah anyway. Everyone's going on about the uh, the the the, um, the show about chess, the ga- the gambit one. I can't remember the full Queen's title. Gambit, that, yeah, that I've one. Seen that. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. Um, is it good? Yeah, it's worth watching because I'm really struggling for something. <laughs> I, yeah, I would watch that. Um, yeah. I watch. Uh, I love that show Euphoria. Don't know if you saw that with the young girls and Daya, and then she just did a a, a a kind of a theatrical film on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called Mark and Mode. Okay. Um, I watched that last night. That was pretty good. But like, we've just watched everything, and we're just, you know, I'd love to do. I, I'd love to do. And this is what this is when you know you're in a good place because I would love to watch what I'm putting out there. I want, I want, I want to connect with my friends. Say, can we watch this together, guys? Um, in all these different cities, I want to hit the lights. I love horror and thriller films. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's just a nice, it's a nice escape. You know, I'm, I'm not doing a drama. I'm not doing a whatever it's just a nice escape from from the reality that we live in right now which is which is a really tough you know reality you know i think a lot of i mean actors must be you know i've been trying to keep in contact and touching base with them because you know very unique um people actors people who think that they're you know very confident and it takes confidence to go out on a stage or do a film but a lot of that confidence comes from being able to be someone else because you aren't always the happiest in your own skin and you can be quite introverted but be a very like flamboyant actor you know um so it's been you know it's been really cool to give people the opportunity to work on this these actors um so yeah i'm excited yeah yeah i am too i, I want to get a ticket for sure <laughs> it sounds great but but what, what, will you always do horror or or have you considered another another genre or is it is it always going to be this sort of like uh the, yeah the, the horror style well i mean i did I, we did um we did an immersive romeo and juliet in london nice. which, which is of course a tragedy um uh, but I, you know i guess i do feel like i'm connected to kind of darker horror violent maybe material sure. um but i always try and find um i think the best people that do it you know, you can laugh out loud in a in a in a Tarantino film. You can enjoy from *Dust Till Dawn*, Robert Rodriguez's horror film, which is one of my favorites, which I've done adaptations of. Which is like, you know, vampires um, meets gangster meets a comedy. You know, you know. So as as people can have a laugh. You know, I don't. You know, it's not just it's not just that kind of that I you know creating something dark. But I think that it's just. I think it's the escape that people like. They like something kind of dark, mysterious. Um, you know, I don't know if, if if I did an immersive comedy or drama, straight drama, how 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 it could kind of work. You know, unless it had horror, horror and tragic elements to it. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't rule anything out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So, if uh, if our listeners would like to. Uh, reach out to you say hi or if they're interested in coming to uh, or jumping online and, and watching the redemption room what, what's the best way for people to to get in in touch with you well i get messages from actors all the time on instagram and i don't i don't mind to be honest um it actually comes in handy for example like i had a girl this is me like hey if you're ever looking for actors um i was actually trying to find i just when i wrote this redemption room and a specific look in mind for this athlete uh, from America and she has a British passport she's American she's really good for the role and I wouldn't have got her in the in the show if, if she hadn't contacted me so I'm on Instagram Richard Crawford director um, and the com- my company Secret Fears is just www.secretfeatersplural.com and you can see information on Redemption Room and you can see some of the shows we've done before and um, I think there's a there's a contact uh, on that website which you know uh, goes through to a different department but can come back to me if it's a, an actor or you know I was an actor myself so I know the hustle for it I know the kind of I don't know the cringe of like oh, you know contacting directors contacting companies but you know we are a company that are fine with it. Cool. 
Very good. There we go, guys. Nice and easy. Um, I'll put all of the links down that you mentioned uh, in the description for the podcast itself. So uh, they'll be able to see that through YouTube and uh, whatever podcast platform they use. Um, good. So before we go, Rich, I know you're very, very busy and you've got a young baby that's probably somewhere at home, I imagine. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to play a little game, if you don't mind. Uh, would you rather? I'm going to ask you five questions. Uh, don't give it too much thought. The first thing that pops into your head. Uh, are you ready to roll? Yeah. Good, good. All right. Number one. Would you rather sing like an opera star or cook like a gourmet chef? Uh, oh, great question. Um, ah, cook like a gourmet chef. Very good. I like it. Number two, would you rather be able to breathe underwater or fly through the air? Uh, breathe underwater. Nice. Would you rather um, eat pizza or ice cream is the only food for eternity? I, I went through a stage uh, when I was living in New York where I ate, ate pizza for an eternity, actually. I used to live off $1 slices, so I'd go for ice cream. Okay, very good. Um Okay, let's uh, slightly morbid question, but if you could choose the way that you die, end this life, how would it be? How would it be done? Um, I think like, you know, really overweight in the south of France in a house surrounded by kind of grandkids, a bit like uh, Vito Corleone. And Lots of a pizza. Huge, <laughs> a huge lunch. And yeah. My heart finally goes, enough. But I'm Amazing. just so content and fat. I just kind of uh, dribble down. I, love I that. think that'd be. I think. I think that's how I'd like to go. Nice. So, so maybe some dollar sliced pizzas surrounded uh, somewhere in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. And last but not least, if you could do one thing to make the world a better place, what would it be? Um, I think it would be to get more interesting, uh, humane people into politics. I think that uh, that's the, the, the politicians are, that we have and that we vote in, in Britain, in Hong Kong, in America, are, are, I, don't, I don't know what we're thinking. You know, I think more people need to, more interesting, honest people need to stop doing the arts or anything else. Um, athletics or whatever they find themselves doing and get into politics. So we actually have some decent options of some real people and make a real difference. Love it. All right. And very lastly, Richard, um, with all of my guests, I'm asking for their final thoughts, uh, a way to approach life, a way to deal with difficult circumstances, a way to embrace positive and negative uh, change. Um, can you give us one thing, your final thought that, that I hope, you know, ideally uplifting and inspiring for our listeners out there? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think something that changed my life was um, I just moved to America I, and I got given a dog, right? Really, in, in really weird circumstances. And he's now like 11 years old and that completely transformed my life because then I needed to live next to parks I need to start each day. I need to start each day walking my dog and having a coffee. I can't rush into work, rush onto my phone. I can't do anything of that. And it's such a simple way of giving like a small, cute thing. I, I always wanted like a big, tough dog. He's like a small ball of fur. So every day I have to start in nature and it kind of changed my outlook on a lot of things. I didn't, I could process my thoughts, be around nature, be with my dog. He's loyal to me. He'll never leave me. He'll never steal from me. He's like <laughs> the best, the best thing ever. So I think like that would be my advice is to be just to those little simple things in life. And, and it's probably why I've never had therapy or anything like that, because I do feel like I've had this connect. I've taken him everywhere. He's been everywhere. He was actually in a couple of shows. Oh, amazing. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's kind of, um, you know, those kind of simple um solutions to, to to quite dramatic problems because you know it, like i said you know i have a bit of a tough time in life and it kind of changed a lot of things for me that kind of relationship with him very good love it all right there you go guys that is richard crawford and you're we're gonna uh post all the links for our listeners to jump on and 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 hopefully come and see your show or, or just to say hello um thank you very much for joining us today richard i really appreciate it and uh 
I wish wish you all the best with Redemption yeah. Room, and I'm going to uh, do my best to to jump on and watch it as well. So please do, please yeah. do let me know your thoughts.